I'll be the only one getting recorded so you don't have to worry. I want you to turn in your Bible to Isaiah chapter 40. Hold your finger there. I want to share something with you first on step one. It's 890. You're welcome. Thank you very much. You're Okay. As we approach step one, okay, we need to remember something about God. He alone is the all-powerful one. God does all things perfectly. We do not. <laughs> Throughout the pages of the Bible, God has sought to show His people how powerless we are in ourselves and how much we need His intervention and help. God called Abraham to be the father of many nations, and then He gave him a barren wife. God called Moses to lead His people to the Promised Land, and then He made him wander in a desert for 40 years. God called Gideon to defeat the Midianites, and then God took away Gideon's army and its weapons. God called the Virgin Mary to be the mother of the Messiah, and then he gave her no husband. In every case, God's people cried out to him in their powerlessness. They wanted to obey God's call in their lives, but they were totally unable to fulfill it. The effect of their separation from God was impotence, unmanageability, and frustration. The same is true for us. We know that God has given us life, and we long to make something of it. But we are powerless. In our own strength and control, life has been unfulfilled. We have lived in an illusion of control. We thought that we were able to manage our lives, but our efforts have brought only pain. Like a patient who tries to perform surgery on him or herself, we have tried to fix our lives, but the fixing only creates greater harm, not healing. For most of us, even the thought of starting this program seems beyond us. We've had so much failure and so many failed self-surgeries that we are at our wit's end. But that's okay. The realization is the beginning of healing. God has brought us to that understanding. It's God's job to dispel the illusions we live in. It's our job to admit our powerlessness when He does. Big amen man, right? All right, look at Isaiah chapter 40. And we're going to go in verse 25. When we admit that we're powerless is when the power of God will kick in. As long as we think there's something in us that can fix ourselves or control a situation is when God can't work with us. He only works for, with us when we admit that we're powerless and that we can't do it without Him. All right, look at verse 25. To whom will you compare me? Who is my equal? Asked the Holy One. Look up into the heavens. Who created all the stars? He brings them out like an army, one after another, calling each by its name. Because of his great power and incomparable strength, not a single one is missing. O oh, Jacob, how can you say the Lord does not see your troubles? O oh, Israel, how can you say God ignores your rights? Have you never heard? Have you never understood? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerlessness. Powerless. Even you. <laughs> I had to do it. Even <laughs> youths will become weak and tired, and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary, and they will walk and not faint. I'm a big amen there. Yeah. But it says those who trust in the Lord. See, if we trust in ourselves, we're not going to get this kind of power. See, when we always try to do it in the flesh, it's just a natural for us, even when we become Christians, to try to help God out. Like, I'm going to do this 
I'm not going to, I'm going to be good today. I'm going to get up and I'm going to be nice to people and I'm going to be good and I'm not going to do the things that I did yesterday. And when you're saying, I, 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 mean, you can't not. Look, if we could do it, we wouldn't need Jesus. So when you get up in the morning and admit that I'm powerless, Lord, if you don't help me, I'm never going to be able to do this, that is when he can come in and help you. So a lot of us have a lot of pride in us, Phil, and it has to get broken out of us, and that's okay. He, he gives us a lot of room. To, he waits a long time before he, he, he requires us to give it all to him. Because we know that we hang on to stuff still as, as Christians, that we still think that you know there's something that we can do. Look, the only, he does for us what we can't do for ourselves, but he doesn't do for us what we can. Like read our Bibles, fellowship with other believers, right? Go to church, go to Bible study, put him first. Pray to him every morning. Make him a priority in your life. Those are things you have to make a choice to do. And once you do that, he comes in and he gives you all the power you need to accomplish his will for your life. But as long as you think that you can do it, then you don't get the power. It only comes in when we admit that we're, we're defeated. Victory comes as a Christian when we admit complete defeat, that we can't do it without him. We, he doesn't need our help, we need his help. So we have to understand, step one is the most important step you can take in this journey, to admit that we were powerless, that our lives have become unmanageable, that we need to go on the new management. Then when we get to step three, right? When we get to step three, we make a decision to turn our will and our lives over to his care. So right now, we have just all we have to do is admit it. Right in step two, right, we come to believe that Jesus can restore us to the state we were in before we made a mess of our lives. And then in step three, we make a decision, okay, now that I understand that I'm starting to trust God now, I'm going to trust him with my life. I'm going to give more of my life over to him. As I grow spiritually, I give more and more over to him and less and less of my flesh shows up. It's a process, and it takes uh, the, the believer uh, his whole life or her whole life to accomplish this. So you have to give yourself a break and understand that God take, uh, uh, lasting change takes time. It takes a long time. Okay, let's introduce step one. Thank you, Pastor. You're welcome. Step one, we admitted we were powerless over the effects of our separation from God that our lives had become unmanageable. I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Romans 7, 18. Understanding step one, when we were young, we were sometimes tickled by those who were bigger than us. They would often tickle us so hard and long that we lost control. Yeah, my brother used to do that. Pin it down. Yeah, they were all his friends used to gang up on each other, the young one. He's not tickling me to death. Brutal. Yeah. Anyway. Tickle me so much you cry. Yeah. We would grasp, we would gasp and cry for them to stop, and we would scream, I quit, I give up, please stop. Sometimes they stopped when we cried, and sometimes they stopped only when someone older or bigger came to our rescue. Step one is like this episode from childhood. Our own life and behavior is like the cruel tickler who inflicts pain and discomfort. We have, we have done this to ourselves. We took control to protect ourselves, but results have frequently ended in chaos. And now we don't want to give up control and release ourselves from the torment. In step one, we admit that we can't stand it anymore. We plead for release. We cry, I quit. Working step one. Step one is an opportunity to face reality and admit that our life isn't working with us in control. We embrace our powerlessness. We stop pretending. In a sense, we stop the juggling act that we have performed for so long. We admit that we can't continue the illusion of control. If that means that all the balls fall to the ground, then so be it. We are so tired of juggling our lives, we are ready to accept whatever comes. 
preparing for step one. The way we manage our own life brings us to the end of our rope. We hit bottom. Our ways and our efforts fail us. At this point, step one provides needed direction for our unmanageability. We prepare ourselves by realizing that step one is the first step in a spiritual journey towards wholeness. This step stops us. It puts a halt on our own efforts and gives us permission to quit. Prayer for step one. Today, I ask for help with my recovery. I feel a little lost and I'm very unsure of myself. Denial has kept me from seeing how powerless I am and how unmanageable my life has become. I need to learn and remember that I cannot manage my life or the lives of others. I also need to remember that the best thing I can do right now is to let go. I choose to let go. I admit that I'm powerless and that my life is unmanageable. The ideas presented in step one are overwhelming to most of us until we begin to see our lives as they really are. It is threatening to imagine that we could be powerless and that our lives could be unmanageable. Our life experiences, however, remind us that our behavior does not always produce peace and serenity. Tell me about it. See, it says our behavior. <laughs> our background, if affected by alcohol or other types of family dysfunction, undermines our best plans, desires, and dreams. Often, our troubled background has caused us to lose touch with God and ourselves. Our lives are full of unwelcome behaviors, and overwhelming emotions. We may have been taught to believe that we only have to accept Christ as our Lord and Savior for our life to be complete and satisfying. This may have been the magic we relied upon to prepare us for the hereafter. Our proclamation that I am born anew, the past is washed clean, I am a new creature, Christ has totally changed me, is true. Our spirits are born anew, but since we have a lifetime of habits and wounds, we need more than salvation. We need transformation, the hard work of change. To over-spiritualize the initial work of salvation may be to deny the actual condition of our lives. A big amen there. The fact that we still feel pain from our past is not a sign of a failed relationship with God. The presence of pain does not lessen the impact of salvation in our lives. This is simply a signal we need to begin the process of healing by daily working the steps with God's help. God will bring the healing and make the necessary changes. To admit to pains and problems may seem a contradiction of our strong claim to salvation, but it is not. The Bible is full of accounts of men and women who struggle continually to overcome past mistakes and life's many temptations. The idea that there are areas of our lives over which we are powerless is a new idea for us. It is much easier for us to feel that we have power and are in control. Paul the Apostle, in this letter to the Church of Rome, describes the powerlessness and unmanageability of his life. He writes to his continued he writes of his continued sinful behavior as proof of his separation from God in Romans 7 14. Yet his admission does not interfere with his commitment to do God's will. Without knowing the details of Paul's background, we can only assume from his comments that self-will was a problem. Paul's will got in the way of God's will. Exactly. Just like our will gets in the way of God's will. Because of our background, we function in much the same way as Paul did. Allowing our self-will to work against us and frustrate God's plan for us. We live in a culture that places a high value on individual accomplishment. Most of us, from the time we were small children, were bombarded by the ideal of high achievement. 
being competitive in school, sports, and business is viewed as important in our society. We are taught that if we compete hard enough, we will be winners, and therefore good people. If, however, we don't measure up to what is expected of us and are losers, we believe we are failures. Due to the absence of good role models during childhood, many of us are confused. We don't know where, to fit, where we fit in. We continue to allow our worth and self-esteem to be determined by what we do and what others think of us, and not by who we are in Christ. Truth. Look, looking back at our past, we may continue to classify ourselves as losers. We may condition ourselves to fail. Our low self-esteem keeps us from becoming winners and causes extreme stress and anxiety. As we mature, matters get worse. The stressful lives we lead gives us no satisfaction, and the stress compounds our problems. Our fears and insecurities increase, creating a sense of panic. Some of us revert to abusing mood-altering substances, such as drugs, alcohol, or food, to relieve our tension. In more subtle ways, we may bury ourselves in church activities, work, relationships, or other addictive compulsive behaviors to try to combat the anxiety that seem to overwhelm us. When we come to grips with ourselves and realize that our lives are just one big roller coaster ride, we are ready for step one. We have no alternative but to admit that we are powerless and that our lives have become unmanageable. When we begin to recognize the seriousness of our condition, it is important that we seek help. Step one forms the foundation for working the other steps. In this vital encounter with the circumstances of our lives, we admit our powerlessness and accept the unmanageability of our lives. Surrendering to this idea is not an easy thing to do. Although our behavior has caused us nothing but stress and pain, it is difficult to let go and trust that things will work out well. We may experience confusion, drowsiness, sadness, sleeplessness, or turmoil. These are normal responses to the severe inner struggles we are experiencing. It is important to remember that surrender requires great mental and emotional energy, as well as determination. Don't give up. A new life of freedom awaits us. Personal reflection. In step one, we come to grips with the reality of our lives. Perhaps for the first time, we finally admit defeat and recognize that we need help. In looking at step one, we see it has two distinct parts. The first part is the admission that we have obsessive traits. Those traits appear in the way we try to manipulate the affairs of our lives to ease the inner pain of our separation, separateness from God. We are in the grip of an addictive process that has rendered us powerless, powerless over our behavior. The second part is the admission that our lives have have been and will continue to be unmanageable if we insist on living by our own will. Mm -hmm. 